Hi, um, I'm Louisa Thomas, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, when I left Boston, where I live, it was uh, 24 degrees, so you can believe me when I say I'm having a wonderful time. Um, in all seriousness, though, I I've, I've actually feel like I've learned so much and been so stimulated by all the talks and um, by my conversations with some of you. Um, in fact, it's led me to return to this talk again and again, revising and tweaking and reconsidering what it is I want to say. I've been circling this subject. Um, and that circling is, in some ways, actually my subject. Um, what is it that I want sports, and particularly athletes, to tell me? Um, last night I was watching the Titans play the Ravens, and I was just like surfing on these feelings as I went to bed. And, um, you know, it was a playoff game. It meant something, I guess. But it was also just kind of a way to unwind at the end of the game. And yet I had this feeling that it, it must be something more profound. Um, why is that? You know, why is it that when we, when athletes finish a game, we, we go up to them and we ask, we have our reporters go and say, how do you, how do, how do you feel? And what we want them to tell, tell us is, how are we supposed to feel? Two years ago, I went to San Antonio to interview Becky Hammond for a profile in The New Yorker. Hammond was the first woman to be hired as a full-time assistant in the NBA, or for that matter, any of the major sport, American sports leagues. I wasn't sure what to expect from her. As an organization, the Spurs are notoriously reluctant to grant access to outsiders, and their head coach, Greg Popovich, is famously cranky and taciturn with reporters. I've been pursuing an interview with Hammond for weeks. Every day, I left a message with the Spurs communication director, usually without any response. When I skipped a day, he actually called me and, and told me that he was insulted that I hadn't called. <laughs> I FedExed a letter to her house. I made an appeal to the NBA commissioner. I mean, finally she relented. But only, I think, actually after the commissioner intervened. Um, and most New Yorker stories are written after a reporter has had the chance to immerse herself in a subject's life. I was given an hour. I met her in the small kitchen of the Spurs practice facility with a tub of pretzels on the table and CNN on the background. And we began to talk and talk and talk. And that hour became two and a half, and that led to phone call after phone call, talks of a visit. I just had a baby, that was hard, but she was a very private person, and she was very guarded about her personal life, but she was very open about basketball and about her ambitions and her reservations and her faith, and I was transfixed. I thought I'd tapped into something. And then I transcribed the tapes, and my heart sank. In my ears, what she said had life and resonance, and on the page, it was totally flat. It was a jumble of cliches. She said things like, playing basketball for me is like breathing. And what I'd responded to was not the words, but the sincerity and the passion behind them, the command that I had been listening for, because I knew her command of the court and her control of the ball. In the end, I tried to bring her, li her to life without actually using that many of her quotes. And I shouldn't have really been surprised by that transcript, because by then I'd been writing about sports for years, and I'd long ago found that most athletes are not the most articulate interpreters of their own experience. There are exceptions, but that was the rule. In fact, it was often better not to talk to them at all, I found, but just to watch and read their body language and kind of imaginatively enter you know, that space. And part of that was structural, which is something that you know, people have talked about over the course of this weekend. You don't get real access anymore, not like the kind of access that led to levels of the game or someone like David Haberstam, who was able to sort of really live with a team or players. You get more than I did with Becky, maybe, but often not much. And even if you do get access, by the time an athlete is at the point where a New Yorker right, might be writing a profile of, running a profile of her, She's most likely been media trained to say as little as possible, often enough to promote the personal and organizational brand, but not enough to be actually interesting, because interesting could be controversial and controversy could cause distraction. And there's nothing that athletes and coaches hate more than distraction. And yet, Hammond had been interesting to me, in person, if not on the page. So that wasn't quite it. And I knew, too, from other experience, that even when athletes are speaking openly, you may not get much. My husband's actually a former NFL player, and he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. He's now getting his PhD in mathematics from MIT. And he has this unique ability to explain complex concepts in clear ways, whether it's a math problem or a football play. 
But when we talk about the emotional experience of playing football or what he's thinking on the field, he becomes suddenly vague. He might talk about the importance of toughness or not worrying what you, about what you can't control. And if you were to ask him about CTE, for instance, he'd tell you that even though he has a rather unique brain, he never really thought about it. And people assume that he's lying, but I lived with him. He meant it. I mean, if you asked him what he was thinking about on the field, he'd say he wasn't consciously thinking of all. And if you ask him what he felt when he heard the roar of the crowd, he'd tell you he'd tune it out. A ghost wrote his memoir, actually, which was half about math, half about football. And I'm not great at math, but the math half was actually much easier to write than the football half. There are, of course, plenty of elite athletes who can tell you in precise detail what they're hearing and feeling at any given moment. There's a Floyd Patterson and Gay Talese is a loser, having just been knocked out by Sonny Liston, thinking, I didn't have to run that extra mile, thinking, I am a coward. But there's plenty of research to suggest that my husband's not thinking is not unique. A new study led by Northwestern researchers recently demonstrated that the brains of top, ap top athletes are actually wired to process sound differently from most people. They have, as the researchers put it, quieter brains. And of course, many athletes draw on pattern recognition and endless training in order to make their decisions automatic and even unconscious. It makes sense that thoughts and feelings are the enemies of action. Look at Hamlet, or look at Tracy Austin, winner of three Grand Slam titles, whose autobiography was savaged by David Foster Wallace for his lack of insight in that essay that Jeff Dyer talked about on Friday night. The real secret behind top athlete's genius then, Wallace wrote, may be as esoteric and obvious and dull and profound as silence itself. The real many-veiled answer to the question of just what goes through a great athlete's mind as he stands at the center of a hostile crowd noise and lines up a three throw that will decide the game might well be nothing at all. It is, of course, possible to describe and value sports without worrying about the interior struggle on the part of athletes at all or worrying about the subjective experience of the crowd. A lot of sports writing now relies on quantifying contributions and statistical trends on metrics instead of narratives. And maybe there is something more honest and rigorous about that. But the idea that an athlete has a kind of empty center or the action is all isn't quite satisfying to me either. And as I thought about writing about Becky Hammond, that wasn't really what was going on either. She did have a story to tell, but it was a story that kept coming back to her, kept coming back to the ineffable, the unsayable, the intertwined faith that, as she put it, she had in God and basketball. You can't separate the two, she told me as we were sitting in the kitchen. It would, like be try it would be like trying to strain my white blood cells from my red blood cells. It would be like trying to separate my personality from my soul. Sports are these great engines of narrative, but the endings are always in doubt. They encourage, even require, a kind of suspension of disbelief in the outcome. They require a kind of surrender. There is a kind of religious aspect to that. You don't know if the day will end in elation. You don't know, and you can only anticipate the pain or the rekindling of hope. They turn faith into feeling. And I heard that feeling in Hammond's vo voice, and I felt it too. At the same time I started writing about sports nearly 10 years ago, I, I began working on a biography of Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife. When people asked me why I was writing about the unknown wife of an obscure president, I'd say, no, not that John Adams, I struggled to answer. I knew what they wanted to hear. They wanted to know what kind of power she had. They wanted to know how she influenced John Quincy's thinking, his policies, the course of United States history. They wanted to know how she'd been a strong woman at a time when women were meant to be weak. They wanted to know what she did and what it meant. And I wasn't dishonest exactly in my replies. I talked about what an effective diplomat she had been living abroad and what a canny politician she had been at home, the necessary warmth to John Quincy's coldness. I talked about how observant she had been and her range of her experiences and her travel and her evolving view of women's rights. And all of this was correct as far as it went, but it's not what drew me to her. What I was actually interested in is what she felt. And the truth was, she had felt powerless. She often had little interest in the workings of state. She'd spent much of her adult life in bed with illness and grief. She'd been pregnant perhaps a dozen times, and most had ended in miscarriage or stillbirth. And of her own, four children, only one outlived her. In the regular estimation of the world, she did not do much. But she felt very deeply, and she wrote about it. 
She wrote and she wrote and she wrote. In the beginning, what she wrote was mostly banal, a visit here, an illness there, but as she grew older, older, she wrote more and read more, and at critical moments, she found someone who would listen, and she began to talk about what she thought and felt. And she became more observant, more sharper, more insightful, more searching. She could be mordant, she could be funny, but she grew alive to the ways that personalities influence social systems and the way those systems shape the course of events. What was her story? To me, it was the record she left of her inner life. She was not in any way a modern woman, but she had a modern voice. Why, you might be wondering, am I talking about Louisa Catherine Adams and a seminar on sports literature? And what do Louisa Catherine Adams and Rebecca Lynn Hammond have in common? On the face of it, nothing. Adams was born in London in 1775. Hammond was born in South Dakota in 1977. Adams spent much of her life in bed. Hammond was one of the best athletes in the world. Adams was overlooked and underappreciated. Hammond's name has been floated as a potential head coach of one of sports' more story, most storied franchise, the New York Knicks, but that's a totally another story. So why is it that I thought of it as one larger project? And I think it's because they were both in their disparate ways circling something, trying to communicate this kind of upswell of feeling that they couldn't explain and couldn't describe, but felt meaningful. They were trying to figure out something about themselves, as Rowan put it in our panel in tennis. Being something of a searcher myself, I was drawn to that and to the challenge of trying to translate it into something legible and trying to understand something about myself by reading in between those lines. There are, of course, lots of other things that drew me to sports, just as there are lots of other things that drew me to history. We've heard about many of them this weekend. Race, gender, money, common conceptions of fairness, the ever-present tension between politics, and transcendence, the body, style, glory, and loss. But there's no way to exhaust that list because there's something about sports that speaks to something past the power of words. And I think many of you might know or have a sense of what I'm groping at. You don't have to be an elite athlete to know, even once the pure sensation of striking a tennis ball with perfect control or the burning elation of sprinting with lengthening strides. You don't have to be a baseball enthusiast to be thrilled by the sudden explosion of sound from a well-hit ball, or to be sickened by the splintering sound of a shattering bat, or the harsh clang of a puck against a post. You can be convinced, concerned by the violence of American football and still find grandeur in the spectacle. You can be a sports agnostic, but be moved by the communities of devotion that develop around what the world, rest of the world calls football. You don't have to be a hardcore tennis fan to understand why Wallace, in a different essay, once called Roger Federer, hit a forehand, a religious experience. Or why Becky Hammond said there is only one story about her life. And that's maybe a bit much, but I'm always asking too much of sports. Games are trivial, but I want them to mean something. My feelings are evanescent, but I want to capture them. They feel sort of out of my control, but I want to bring them into order. I want to put them into lines. And so I watch and rewatch. I consider, I reconsider, I write and revise. It seems to me that often being a sports fan is very much like being a writer, returning to something again and again and again, feeling it again and again and again. Seasons come and go and the game ends and another begins. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Or we can operate. We're going? Yeah, we're on? Oh, hi. Great, thank you, Louisa. Um, I always think of that quote from Eric Dolphy about music, you know, it's in the air and then it's gone. And I wonder if you wanted to say something about the way that with sport, part of its ineffability is, of course, its transience. We've, we've all had that thing of taping a game 
In fact, it happened just yesterday. And you know, you try to do what you can to avoid hearing the result, and then somebody mentions the result to you, and then, well, there's no point watching it. <laughs> so perhaps you could expand on, on that. I think that even essence is really a critical part of sports. I mean, the fact is that sports are, sports are stories. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But sports are kind of unique in that we don't, we don't know the end. And we put so much kind of freighted meaning in the end. When I was talking to Arlo about what, what we should be talking about, you know, I sort of, you know, I said, you know, maybe I would talk about the ineffability of sports. And he said, you know, it's interesting. We, there are some similarities between music, which is another thing that sort of disappears as soon as you've heard it. Um, and art, but we don't really ask, we don't go and ask an artist right after they've, we've seen their painting, well, well, please explain this to me, <laughs> you know? We sort of trust ourselves to do the interpretive work. Um, but I think one of the reasons for that is, you know, a piece of art or a piece of music or a, 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 a book has a kind of end that's decided by somebody else, whereas a piece of, of a piece of sports, a game, you know, we don't know where it's going to go and it's in the struggle to win that something happens. And we can't really, it's hard to sort of make sense of that. And as soon as it's happened, it both has like more meaning than it should. And also the meaning sort of disappears as soon as it's happened. Like as soon as you know the result, like all the possibilities sort of collapse into something like, oh, well, now I don't even need to watch it anymore. It's sort of in that kind of like suspension, you know, sort of what I refer to as like the suspension of disbelief that the kind of interest or excitement or surge of intense feeling does happen. Up top. Thank you. Um, hopefully I can put this into words, but what I'm interested in is, you know, there is the language, the spoken language, yeah. um, but I, what I'm hearing you say, and we've done a lot of exploration um, on our own leadership team in our school, is what are all the messages we're getting when we physically feel something? You know, that the body and the physicality of each of us gives us so much information, but we're not used to putting that information into words or identifying those physical feelings as information. And I think of athletics being so physical, mm -hmm. and maybe that sense of what it means is coming through a physical feeling and the translation to words is just something we've stopped doing. Right, well, I mean, there's certainly, a, like, if you're playing a sport, there's a bunch of, you know, you've got adrenaline and all these kind of surge of, surge of, you know, hormones, really, that are telling you to feel something. Um, but also there's this weird reflection that happens, right? If you're watching a sports and you're really into it, your heart rate goes up. You know, it's as if you're running yourself, you know? And if you're sad, you might cry. I've cried, you know, watching sports. I mean, that's a physical, thing that happens and there's this kind of very, I mean, part of I think what draws me to sports is just the intensity of the feelings. It's this arena in which like you really are allowed to feel. Um, movies are like that too, right? They're like kind of safe spaces <laughs> for feelings. Books can be like that. I mean, any sort of like, in some ways like artificial constructed world. Um, but sports, you can sort of share, you can share it and that's also it feels I think partly one of the things that Jeff is talking about, it feels real because it feels like happening in real time, you know, whether or not it's on the tape or not. Like, it feels like, you know, there's only one way to feel at any given moment, and it's like so intense and it's so powerful, and it does feel biological, you know, and, and then it, it sort of disappears and you go about your ordinary day. And I mean, like, but it can be very intense, and it can feel very out of control. And I think that. Yeah, I mean, the, the kind of mind-body connection that we sort of usually like overlook, I think is a really kind of salient one here. What was the relationship of John Quincy Adams' wife to her mother-in-law? Oh, <laughs> uh, they were, well, she, Abigail Adams was, um, she was very much a mother-in-law. Um, Louisa Catherine Adams, when she first arrives in Quincy, she's 26, she's sick, she's got a newborn, she's like exhausted, she's just had this, she's just said goodbye to her father who's dying. She arrives in, in Quincy and Abigail Adams um, has prepared this like, you know, dinner for everybody. She's made special little meal for Louisa Catherine Adams because her 
opinion is that Louise is so delicate that she can't handle, you know, a normal New England winter, a normal New England meal. And Louisa writes, um, Quincy, had I stepped onto Noah's Ark, I could not have been more astonished. <laughs> I mean, it's just so alien to her. And Abigail is this kind of force of nature. And she's pretty mean, to be honest, to Louisa. I mean, she's very undermining and passive aggressive. Um, but they become much closer as, as um, they both grow older. And by the end of Abigail's life, she and Louisa are, are incredibly close. And Louisa is actually sending her um, segments of her diary, and um, they're really kind of having a, a very kind of deep conversation about what their lives mean, and their children, and politics, and ideas, and yeah. So as a journalist, we, a, a female journalist, entering the bastions of men's locker rooms and, and feelings and so forth, what you've reported on the athlete, but how about yourself? H how do you handle um, maybe the put downs or the, the takeaways that make it easier because you know someone intimately who's a, a male football player and so forth? But how does the journalist handle some of these same feelings? Um, you know, I, I think I'm lucky that I didn't have to be in the first wave of women going into locker rooms. Um, you know, I interviewed Jackie McMullen, who was one of the kind of great. Um, women's, well, one of the great basketball journalists of either gender, but she was one of the first women, and she'd have athletes like throwing hair dryers at her and kind of really saying horrible things. I mean, I'm actually treated with a lot of respect, like coaches might call me sweetie or whatever, but um, I'm not, you know, <laughs> kind of like ordered out. And um, I think you're, I, you get used, very quickly get used to being the only woman in the room. Um, you know, I think that sometimes it can be a, you know, actually a help. If I'm in a, you know, a small press conference and I'm the only woman, I'm usually called on. <laughs> um, things like that. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a, it's not a world of true equality by any means, but um, I do think things have gotten a lot better and more respectful. I'm a uh, Baltimore Ravens fan and as, had to watch in horror yeah. as all the expectations about them being, you know, destined for the Super Bowl. And I wonder if you ever uh, spend time talking, uh, you know, interviewing about the feelings of the spectators who put their heart and soul and hopes for yeah. a team and then watch them just, you know, crash. Well, I think that, I mean, I think that the relationships between spectators are, are just cr society in general, kind of communities in general and, and teams and athletes is like really fascinating because um, often people derive so much of their I, parts of their identity from these people they've never met, you know, and they have no connection to and, um, and who might be coming and leaving, you know, in any kind of just, they're there for maybe even only a few weeks. Um, and yet it comes to feel so kind of invested and visceral and, um, you know, people refer to their teams as we, you know, I mean, it's, it's um, at times if you're if you have any distance from it, it feels very looks very strange. But if you're inside of it, it feels very natural. Like of course, you know, and that's both the the power of sports and also its peril because you know it's it's not like that actually. You know, it's and and so, but that's part of what I'm talking about. These like the intensity of feelings and because the, the athletes are feeling also incredibly, you know, intense. I mean, if you are hearing about the locker room after the game, you know, the players are just like in shock, the Ravens are, because they, just like everybody else, expected to win, you know? And um, that's a real feeling. And then, you know, the, the kind of true sadness of fans is a real feeling too. But one of the interesting things is that you can be marked by that. And then it's like, well, it is just a game and next season starts now. And, you know, it's sort of a weird thing like that. I wanted to ask kind of a similar question. Fans invest so much of themselves in players and teams. How do the players and teams feel about the fans? Uh, it depends. I mean, I think, I think it depends a lot on the player. I mean, a lot on the player. And it depends a lot on the, um, the sport and the, you know. I mean, so college football, I'll, I'll talk, you know, not to, 
borrow my husband's experience too much, but he played football at Penn State, but he was also a student at Penn State, you know, and he feels like a very, very closely connected to that school, um, just as, you know, kind of as closely connected as any of the fans do. Um, whereas, like, I think a lot of, in professional football, you're, it's more of a mercenary situation. You know, you're, you might be traded tomorrow, you might be there for your whole career, you know, every relationship with a city and a team is a little bit different. Um, you know, and I think in a sport like tennis, you know, it's people, even though you're not, you're really representing your country, you know, I think that people who have like a, like Simona Halep has a Romanian fan base, you know, and she feels very closely connected to those, although they're sometimes very harsh and, you know, that's a fraught relationship sometimes, or Novak Djokovic is very much like a Serbian, you know, and, and really kind of feels connected to those fans, but also wants the love of it. I mean, this is sort of another story, but, um, I mean, what I'm saying is I think that it's, you know, it's sort of, it's as unique as, as it is we all are unique. I mean, but the circumstances kind of change every relationship between. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, maybe the expectations we have for narrative, like being applied to sports and specifically the, or maybe our expectations for, um, for, feeling yeah. and I'm thinking a lot of, of Twitter and you know, yeah. television and like kind of the modern era where everything from players actions to inactions on the field off the field are like endlessly dissected and mm -hmm. it seems to connect to the way that fans feel yeah. and the way that players feel and do you feel like this the modern moment um, postmodern mo moment I guess has changed the way that we relate to sports or feel about sports um. I would say yes, in the sense that I think a lot of people had less complex, well, I don't know, actually. Um, I do think that there is more of a kind of like, yeah, intense dissection and kind of um, obsession with um, players off the field than there was. You know, it used to be that you could only relate to an athlete, you know, by what they did on the field. You didn't know, you know, what they were, what restaurants they were going to maybe and what bad behavior they were, either because the press protected them or because it just wasn't, you know, there weren't cameras everywhere. Um, but I think that, you know, I think that there is a kind of like intense desire to, I mean, it's a very human desire. So there's an intense desire to connect with other people and to sort of like make sense of these like really kind of deep, powerful emotions. And in so much of our lives, we're not really like allowed to talk about feelings, especially men, you know, we're like not really allowed to sort of get, we're not supposed to cry, you know, or you're not supposed to, you know, turn to your stranger, like turn to your neighbor and like want to hug them, you know, and, but sports are a place where you can do that, you know, or you can high five someone you don't know, or you can, you know, talk to someone in a checkout, supermarket checkout line. I mean, it kind of gives this kind of like, not just common experience, but common like emotional experience. Um, that I think that is like very, very important to many people and they don't have other arenas or other, other avenues. Um, and it also, I think it, it, those feelings are really like kind of ungovernable and like really hard to describe sometimes. And sports sort of like gives them sort of like uh, kind of, yeah, contours of like kind of narratives. You know, we're really obsessed with narratives in sports and we don't really know the outcome and there's the kind of something that we really want to like it helps us control those feelings that sort of feel kind of sometimes too big to control. With, uh, with young kids who play sports like soccer and football and may be susceptible to concussion, mm -hmm. um, it, it seems to me in watching those sports that the coaches, the parents, and the athletes themselves almost sort of collude in, you know, not acknowledging co concussion when it happens. And I wonder if you think that might be because the feelings are so intense and the advocacy for team over individual maybe is so intense that those aren't the people who should be making the decisions about concussion. Well, I think one thing is I think a lot of youth sports people probably aren't trained as well as they should be to recognize. I mean, that's a big thing is that I think that 
there's a kind of like, I know there are protocols that they institute in youth sports, but sometimes it may be that, you know, they don't actually really know how to recognize, or they maybe they don't really comprehend the seriousness of head injuries. Um, but certainly, I mean, on every level, um, there is a kind of like instinct toward the team and a kind of privileging of winning over everything. I mean, it sort of like takes over sometimes. And that is why they talk about bringing in, you know, independent people to sort of make those decisions and um, people who presumably don't have any kind of investment in the outcome. Um, you know, with kids, I think like the first thing is helping kids recognize how serious it is so that they feel comfortable saying to a coach, especially because, you know, sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes people don't lose consciousness and, you know, they're not behaving in confused ways. I mean, often they are, but, um, you know, it's really incumbent on us as like a society to teach kids and to kind of also make it okay to say like, look, if you're not feeling right, you know, this is way more important than like even the Super Bowl, not let alone like whatever happening is whatever's happening on a Sunday morning soccer game. Thank you. That's all the time we have.